Hello everybody and welcome to the Rangers Journal. I've decided to do a bit of a deep dive into Rangers manager Philippe Clement's managerial career. In, ep- in an episode one, we're going to start with his, um, his time at Genk. And joining me, I've got um, Tim Oliver Metz from the Genk pod Terrell, Terrell Talks um, to talk us through his spell in charge at Genk. Hi Tim, how are you doing? All right. That's good. I'm doing good. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the pod. No, any problem at all. Um, do you want to tell the listeners what you got up to? Is uh, it's a podcast covering Genk, isn't it? Correctly, we're uh, the first, and as of today, still only fan podcast of uh, KRC Genk called Terrell Talks. Uh, me and my uh, my good buddy Lawrence uh, founded it. In, in the meantime, we have a panel of four with uh, Wim and uh, Peter Jan, who also joined. So uh, it's just the four of us every two weeks uh, ranting on, ch- chatting on about KRC Genk. And then every two other weeks, we invite a central guest, which can be someone from in the club, around the club, an ex-player, ex-coach, uh, anyone. So to keep things interesting, because... We thought, yeah, nobody would give a shit about our opinion, but apparently people do give a shit about our opinion, which you right, will probably endorse as a podcast maker. Uh, people will quickly start giving oh, shit about aye, opinion. Aye. Uh, yeah, that's what uh, what we do right now. I would say the Rangers fans are more than welcome uh, to uh, to join in, but the podcast is in Dutch, and we currently have the former striker of uh, Celtic scoring goals for us, so uh, I think we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the striker? Uh, Ki Hyun Oh. Oh, he'll, oh, he'll right. oh, right. he'll oh right. sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Signed him in the summer, didn't you? That's right. Uh, in the summer, he started uh, as a second string striker, but he uh, last last weekend we we clinched the win against uh, KV Mechelen uh, at home. We were zero uh, one behind. He scored a brace to uh, get us through among with one goal one minute after stoppage time. So uh, actually, the game was done, and he yeah, like well, he's. He's fantastic, but we also have uh, Thomas Buffel as one of the legends, which uh, you will know as well. Uh, yeah. Still, Cyril Dessers also has a past at Hank, and then Philippe Clement, which is why we're here today, I, I believe. Yep, yep. So, see when Phil- uh, Philippe Clement took over, um, Genk, what kind of what was the circumstances at the club? What kind of position was the club in? He took over in the middle of the year um, after we uh, we had a coach who 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 yeah where where the the chemistry never really never really kind of took off and uh, Philippe Clément was at that time um, the coach of a smaller Belgian team called Wasland Beveren, uh, which is a team with a lower budget, smaller stage, you know, low lower yeah. end of the team, usually fighting against relegation. But he made them play really good football, parked them somewhere. In the half of the le- of the of the left side of the table, uh, doing a really good job, and and everybody was Im- impressed from the pundits to his colleagues. So it uh, it quickly caught fire um, because he's he's he was very well known already as as a player. Um, he was like more of a defensive midfielder kind of player. Uh, he played for uh, mainly for uh, Beerschot, maybe you know the mm-hmm. team from Antwerp, uh, KRC Genk as well, long down uh, down the line, but also for Club Brugge. Uh, he played there for uh, the biggest part of his of his career, so he was already well known. He was a uh, assistant manager uh, for a long time, uh, and his career planning actually was really good. So um, he wound up at uh, Wasan Bevere, and you could see that his new ideas, uh, yeah, he he really hit the ground running um, at Wasan Bevere. So at uh, I think we were one of the first teams that fired our manager uh, in that season. Mm-hmm. And so the the choice was logic to go for Philippe Clement because of the footballing ideas that he brings. Genk always want to dominate possession, uh, bring good football. Uh, they 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 they're a footballing team. They play out of action, not out of reaction. Um, and of course, being an ex-player, uh, the choice was easily made for both the club and for him to uh, to join us. So we were we were sitting somewhere at the right side of the table. Um, players didn't have a lot of confidence uh we 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 had a lot of players of which people knew that they had potential but the previous managers never really made them tick never really never really uh made a good collective team out of them 
Um, so that's what he what he found there. He he he, he wound up at Genk his first day. He said, "Yeah, uh, I've rarely seen a team that has such a low confidence uh, or, or self uh, self confidence." I mean, um, and that was his job to uh, to bring that back and uh, and get us back to uh, to winning ways. Would you say when he first came in, they managed to do that? Did they make quite a, an impact and make small changes to to change the fortunes again? It did. Um, one of the first games was against the team where we where we uh, acquired him from against Walstand Bevere. Um and you, uh, you, at the end we uh, managed to win there. We also bought one player from Walstand Bevere, which is very uh, extraordinary because it usually would never happen. Uh, I think it was Sek, also a number six player, uh, big, strong, athletic guy. He scored the winning goal, even I uh, believe, to uh, to see us uh, is win that game. So usually it takes one game under a new coach to, uh, to to turn it around, and he and he managed to do it. I would say the shock effect wasn't as big as you might expect, um, because the the players mental mentally the players were were so low that they needed a couple of victories to. To find their stride, to find um, yeah, to 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 uh, get acquainted with the principles that Philippe Clément had, um, and also Philippe Clément uh, really put a big em- emphasis on uh, on physical strength uh, because he um, he really wants to play in the small space. Uh, he uh, employs the gegen press, which back then was a bit more uh, revolutionary than it is today. Mm-hmm. Um, he he and he also uh, wanted a lot of intensity, not only on the pitch. He always said. I want intensity also on the on the on the training field. So he would rarely spend more than one or two minutes explaining uh, an, a drill to the players because he wanted them to continuously, you know, once they're warmed up, uh, keep on going at full gas, as he said uh, during during training. Uh, he said, "I don't believe in in uh, easy chill trainings during the week and then going full gas." Uh, uh, in the weekend, it just doesn't happen. So that's uh, another factor that's uh, on a on a physical level, the players just weren't there where you wanted them to have, which resulted in the fact that the um, the run up to the level that eventually we reached was a bit slower than um, than you would expect. But luckily, the results were there uh, rather uh, rather rather quickly. That's good. That's that's really really interesting. How was the players' fitness? Just in general, after coming, they've been in charge of you. Uh, the players' fitness. If I don't have any data, uh, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just in general, just like did they appear? Did mm. you pick up many injuries and things like that? It's just it's a problem he's had since coming to Rangers. Um, well, it's 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 funny that that you ask. Actually, yeah, uh, we had in one season two players who torn who tore their. Um, I don't know really how, how to say in English their their MCL on their knees. Yeah, okay. um, uh, two players who did it in one season. Uh, Sander Berge, who, who is one of them, uh, might be uh, you might know him, and then Brian Hanna, who still plays here uh, right now. So um, I think that was a result also of some uh, some problems that they had in the in the in the, the physios room uh, with 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 staff coming and going there, but also with the the physical yeah they they had some catching up to do um on that and he demands 100 percent of his players also in training uh but that's i th- i'm i'm afraid one of the side effects now that you mentioned it yeah i'm pretty sure it's one of the side effects and you could be unlucky and and some of those injuries could be pretty long um i wouldn't yeah. say we had more uh, injuries more often but when we had them the injuries were were longer were, were of longer duration than you would you know normally you say like oh he's uh he's he stopped training on on Tuesday, but he'll be fit for the game on Sunday. Those kind of things. Uh, but then it was like, yeah, he'll be out for two, three, four weeks, and it happened yeah. quite often in the first season. Yeah. See, in terms of um, the you know, the manager's tactics formations, was he able to? Did he play the same formation again all the time, or was he able to change it in game to get a result if needed? I've rarely seen him change uh, formation. Only uh, at the end of the game, when we were trailing by one goal, he would eventually switch to something that resembled a four-two-four. Um, but then again, he always said a formation is just a formation. It's it's how your player starts. Um, I remember that that in that possession, for example, his uh, the backs would always go go up really high. Um, if we had to fight for a, to to to, uh, to maintain a lead, 
the backs would stop doing that. So the tactical flexibility was there, but not in terms of formation. Uh, formation, he usually went for the, with a classic 4-2-3-1 or 4-3-3. He switched um, during the he, during his second season at, at Genk. He switched. He had to switch um, halfway the season because we lost our uh, our playmaker, Alejandro Pozuelo, uh, who chose to uh, get rich in the desert uh, and leave us. And that's actually the point where um, where he went from a from a classic four two three one midfield, more to like a a, a, a rear shaped diamond um, mm -hmm. with a, with six and then two eights, but a rotating midfield, um, which actually seamlessly uh, replaced our playmaker, uh, and that's something that he'll he was really applauded by um, by the fans, by the board, and by the players themselves that he seamlessly replaced in the year that we eventually won the title but the margins were always very narrow uh that he managed to replace the best player there and you wouldn't even speak of him anymore at the end of the season so that's also a kind of tactical flexibility um that he has but coming back to your question uh for example going from a 4-3-3 to a 3-4-3 in the middle of a game i've rarely seen him do that what was his um, style of play? His play style was a you, you say he liked to play the ball fast. What was it again? What did the, his team do most? Um, what his team did most, or or yeah, like I said, he was he was a big fan of of, of pushing the backs high. Um, he always uh, aimed for a for a big man mentality. What uh, for a for a uh, uh, yeah for the big man mentality at the game, but also in uh, training. What he usually did is pushing his back so high that in possession he would drop his uh, number six um, to the to the defensive line to form a back three with very wide um, center backs, uh, pretty much what uh, what you see these days a couple of times. But then again, in 2018, it was more revolutionary, especially in Belgium, uh, mm -hmm. than than it is right right now. Uh, he would do that. Um, and then he would actually look at the strength of his midfield. But usually what he did, he, he would take his playmaker and he would um, make sure that he created overloads in, in the half spaces. Uh, right. Because the, the, the playmaker is really good at playing at the, at the narrow spaces, uh, quick little turns, quick little passes to do. And by creating the overloads in the half spaces in the center of the pitch, the flanks were usually left open. Uh, he really likes speedy runs down the flanks. Um, guys who infiltrate, um, usually, and it's up to you to say uh, yes or no. But um, he 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 un the crosses uh, crosses from 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 the sidelines are very unusual with uh, Clement. He usually likes to right. wants his backs and his wings to reach the back line and then give like a cutback or a forty five um, to one of the strikers or or one of the infiltrating uh, midfielders. Which also brings us to the midfield. His his eight, the number eight, uh, really has to run a lot. Um, is usually the the third man that makes the run um, because of those overloads. The space comes up, and then you would usually have to speak in football manager terms. His number eight pop up as a mazala to also right. operate in the uh, in the half space that opened up because of the ten uh, doing the overloads on the other side. If that makes sense to you. Aye, aye. It's, it's, it's interesting to hear because you say about his main playmaker. I automatically thought Mohamed Diamandi. Oh, yeah. Because Mohamed Diamandi is very good at taking the ball in small spaces and dictating the play. The thing he's got, the biggest frustration Diamandi's got is the players aren't finding Diamandi quick enough. Oh, yeah. If that makes any sense. So then he's crowded out in the middle of the park and the half space is gone. Oh, um, yeah. But it's interesting because Diamandi sort sort of takes up with the number eight role, mm -hmm. and we've got a, we've got a number ten, and then the number six, who's more like a number eight, is called Connor Barron. He is kind of he would be box to box, all action, tenacious, that type of player. Okay, um, but he's having to operate as a number six just now and try and protect the back four, so that when the fullbacks go high up the park, mm -hmm. Barron's having a lot a lot of space he needs to cover. If that makes sense, we've not seen many cutbacks yet, right enough from the the wide men. So the but, six still operates in front of the of the back two yeah. when the when the backs push up. Okay, yeah. Back back in Genk, he would shift him actually to the to the right back. That was Sander Berges' uh, job, 
but he's like yeah he's like one meter 95 big guy uh maybe it's not the same as your number six so uh yeah that's oh, he's tiny. <laughs> he's yeah, tiny. yeah that's something but um that also is something that that um that is typical of of clement in his way of playing he always tries to assume that to go out from their own strength um usually at Henk it meant uh fullbacks come really high and then in the rest defense the central defenders would also uh push push forward to make the pitch really really small um mm -hmm. so when the attackers uh when they when they lose the ball the the distance that they have to cover is a lot more small you know so so you can uh cover it more quickly at, at higher intensity so when you push up high um and when the ball comes above or, or further than the than the halfway line uh, and if you can already um regain possession over there uh that means that one fullback or one midfielder also has to come from less far uh to make a uh to make a good run or a good or a good action so um that's one thing uh and he also one last thing that i recall was in defense um mm -hmm. on defending defending crosses he um he used man marking man which marking. was which was new for for our team. I don't know how, how, how it was at Rangers, but that's that was new for us. See, in terms of crosses, there's been an awful lot made out of Rangers corner kicks, right? And it's the need for a set piece coach because when Stephen Gerrard was here, he had a set piece coach who managed to get Rangers scoring from corners. When Clement was asked about a set piece coach, Clement says, "I I I, like, I myself like to take control of mm -hmm. the corner kicks." Did Genk manage to score a lot from set pieces? Not more or less than uh, usually. Um, we right. have a couple of members in our staff which are always there. Uh, Philippe Clement did bring did bring his assistant, uh, but mm -hmm. for the rest the yes, staff mm -hmm. stayed the same. Uh, and we have one guy there, Domenico Oliveri, who for the for the the most part of the years has always been in charge of set pieces. Uh, it might be that Philippe Clement used a um, couple of tweaks left left and right or or, or such but uh, I don't recall that his corners were particularly more dangerous than uh, any other coaches could you maybe send your same your set piece coach up to Glasgow no no he's an <laughs> absolute legend moving. at the club he's not going anywhere <laughs> <laughs> he's not moving <laughs> I'm sorry um see in terms of youth players yeah. that that the young players get a game under Philippe come on because there's an awful lot of what he's saying at Rangers is, is that the players between the B team or the reserve team, as you might know, the gap mm -hmm. and the level is too big for them to step up to the first team. Uh, Was did, did he give youth players a game time at Genk? We had the same problem. Um, like now, the problem has been mitigated because for two years we have our B teams from most from the biggest Belgian clubs that can play in the second division. Uh, but back then, that was not the case. Um, Genk has always been a team that um, that relies heavily on its uh, on its youth academy. Um, the names everybody knows the names if you know a bit of football uh, that we've produced and still produce to this day. Recently, with uh, Bilal El Canous going to Leicester and Mike Penders being bought as one of the fifty-five uh, goalkeepers for Chelsea, but you no, know, he's still there. Um, uh, paradoxically enough, uh, that year we didn't have a lot of youngsters in the uh, in the squad. Um, must have been like a transition year in the youth. Um, that was that actually um, allowed him to 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 play with older players. We of course had um, Leandro Trossard, uh, who plays at Arsenal now. Oh, well, yeah. uh, who was there? Um, that that was one we had. Um, we had two promising goalkeepers. Um, not not famous in belgium but i don't think for for scottish football players uh, uh fans um very famous and then we had an australian guy from like 32 years old danny vukovic and he always relied on danny vukovic to uh to play um we had a, a left back i mean kamas but he never really broke through because he always he didn't have the level we had a number six who could also play center back who played a couple of games but he never really got launched um apart from that yeah of course we had uh leandro trossard and then there were some other younger guys but judging from where they are now they just didn't have the quality so um he didn't really launch any new youth players uh that's not the case maybe except for 
Um, except for Leandro Trossard, that uh, that could be one. Um, but other than that, like compared to the coach that we have now, who who has already uh, who's playing with the 16-year-old uh, Caretsas that we have right now, uh, who's who's obsessed with using youth players, uh, Philippe Clément was not uh, um, because he was so good at um, at getting players to play by their level. Um, right. that he rarely had to go watch in the youth teams. I mean, he went to watch the youth teams, of course, but I think he, he had enough with the, with the squad that was there uh, to, yeah. to get the necessary quality. See, in terms of first-team players, was he able to improve players that were already there when he took the job and sell Absolutely. them on for bigger fees? Was he a good player developer? 100%. 100%. We, uh, I, I opened transfer markets uh, as a preparation to this to, to see um, everybody that left after the after the season. Um, we, for example, we had Sander Berge uh, go to uh, Sheffield United for 25 million euros, almost the same in pounds. Leandro Trossard to Brighton for over 15 million. Uh, Ruslan Malinovsky uh, to Atalanta for 30 million. Ali Samata. Uh, who had his miracle season at Genk. Then he went to Aston Villa for 10 million and then nothing happened anymore. Uh, Joseph Adu, if you know him, went to Celta de Vigo for 8 million. Yeah. Um, we had, you know, there were some really big, really big transfers. And those are all players that we bought for uh, for a lot lower. Um, and, you know, the, the the board was starting to get critique because the potential that they were given was not coming out of, the, of those players under Albert Stavenberg, the, the trainer before him. And um, he, yeah, he he made it work. He he because he plays to the strengths of the players. He 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 uh, his tactic revolves around the strengths of the squad, which sounds simple, but apparently there's still up to this day not a lot of uh, not not a, a lot of managers who do that. Who was his biggest success story? See, in terms of individual players, who who really really improved under him? Would you say? Who maybe went from being not a good player in the fans' eyes to being one of the one of the first starters? I would say Ali Samata. Um, okay. He became a fan favorite uh, at the end, but uh, in the beginning it wasn't certain at all. He came from Mazembe, which is a team in Congo, so we scouted him in Congo, okay. which is which was particular. Um, mm -hmm. So he arrived, uh, we had uh, a Greek guy and a Danish guy um, up front, so he was a third striker. Um, scored the odd goal every now and then, but he really turned Samata into, into a killer, uh, a goal-scoring yeah, machine. Uh, if if Aston Villa comes and, and buys you for over 10 million, yeah, then then, uh, then I think you did, a, you did a great job. So that's definitely one, um, one that, to remember. Um, I'm thinking who else? Um, might be there, yeah. I think Leandro Trossard. He 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 exploded under under uh, Clement. Uh, he was a talent. He he had a good dribble, but he really also started giving assists, scoring goals under um, under Clement, which was also. Uh, Do you think was that a, a role change within the team for Trossard, or was it? What do you think Clement done to give him the platform to play? Kind of thing. Do you think it was just give him game time, play him, yeah, or was there something? Or was there something that he done in particular on the pitch tactically? To no, get I think uh, not. Not really tactically. Like he was a left winger, which is uh -huh. as easy as you as you want it to be. But um, I think he 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 gave the he gave him a lot of trust uh, because the season before Trossard would also play, um, but he's, he 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 wouldn't be as uh, effective on the pitch as you might expect from a left winger. And that's something that I think, with with a with a good dose of trust, that Clement definitely gives because he's a great people manager. Uh, he gave it to 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 Trossard, and we can all see uh, the kind of player that he that he has become today. Uh, he's a great player. He's a great player. Absolutely. Did, um, what was um, Clement's relationship like with the fans? Did they all love him? Did they ever go through a spell where it was very challenging for him that maybe the fans didn't want him? Uh, I think we never really had like a, a bad run of form um, mm -hmm. where where all the finger pointing went to Clement. That never really happened. Um, but um, near the end of the season, we were completely in the race of the title. Our biggest rivals for that title were Club Brugge, uh, also one of the teams where he where he played for. And, 
started you know some rumors were starting to pop up saying that yeah he's gonna sign for club Brugge at the end of the season uh, of course it's it's that was a bit weird because he kept on denying uh that that he was gonna sign with uh, club Brugge, but everybody knew like yeah it's it's going to happen sooner or later but you're in a title fight with that team um how is he going to how is he going to continue to 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 play the next games to to be professional when he's actually playing against his next uh against his next boss to say or against his next team so that was pretty weird and the fact that he kept on denying it let, made some gang fans say like yeah he's just lying in front of our faces because everybody knew it was going to happen but then again i understand that he says that he didn't make it public and say like yeah i'm going to side with uh, club Brugge. he said uh philippe clement said himself um that he was waiting for Genk to give him a, a new offer for the next season, of course, a better offer, maybe with more responsibilities coming his way. Um, and then two days after they, the offer from Genk came, uh, it was made official that he was going to sign for Club Brugge. So you could only think like, OK, how long has this been cooking and how yeah. long has he been uh, yeah, lying or denying it uh, to our faces? That's really the only thing um, where where the relationship between between uh philip clement and the fans uh got a bit sour but before that no he was also he was always very very passionate very uh uh very involved knowing what the what the club wants uh what the fans want so he was really in touch because he's a former player from 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 so he knows what it is to play for uh for the for the team what did the gink fans love most about philip clement what was your favorite thing about him? The way how we how we made the team um, mentally unbeatable. Um, there were times that we we started a game, we started a, a derby against uh, uh, in one of our derbies after two minutes uh, being behind zero one. Um, us some some way he he made the team mentally very strong, and I already, I always love it. Can, you would think it's easy for a for a manager to uh, come into a new team and make him play a certain style of football, but to change their mentality and to make them both individually as collectively very strong on a mental note, uh, that they it reminded me of the player that he used to be when he when he was uh, a lot younger, of course. And that I think how he brought that over to his group uh, is one of the favorite aspects of him that I have. Well, well just the last question: What was his biggest achievement while he was manager at Genk? Of course, winning the title. Um, that's that goes without saying. It's uh, although usually at the start of every season, Genk is considered one of the contenders. Um, usually, you have we're not like Scotland. We usually have like five or six uh, teams that could compete for the title um, uh, down the years. But you know, winning the title in Belgium with with Club Brugge or with Anderlecht recently, not that much. But historically, yeah. it's like you know, it's like uh, Celtic and Rangers. Um, but winning the title in Belgium with Genk, that's that's class. That's pure class. And um, you need to be very special as a manager to do that. You need to have a, have a pretty decent group of players to do that. And everything has to click. You need to have mm -hmm. good luck at the, at, the, at, the, at the right times as well, because Genk will never become champion if there's not a bit of luck involved uh, every now and then. Um, but if you work hard, and that's what he said, if you work hard, then then you will find yourself where where luck finds you so that's by far his biggest achievement and something that will put him into the hall of fame of Genk for for always so there you go that was really really good thank you so much for your time Tim Oliver no worries thanks for um, having me on uh, always good to talk about one of our one of the best managers we've ever had so uh, I hope you uh you and the and the Rangers fans keep uh keep the faith in him because he's He's absolutely, he's absolutely got something special, uh, which not all managers have. So uh, cherish him or send him back to Hank. He's always welcome here. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks very much for your time, mate. No worries, Scotty. All right. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye.